They walked in without a care in the world. I acted relaxed, hiding my eagerness, forcing my face to appear bored. The bell above the door rang as it closed, and a group of four teenagers entered. Three girls and one boy. The group spoke in hushed tones as they walked about the store, studying cryptic items that reeked of the occult. Though people were often attracted to the forces they were unable to grasp, those who did go ahead with the ritualistic requirements of my shop were few. My store was perfect to attract those few, however. One of the girls approached the desk to talk to me. Excuse me, she said. I feigned interest. Yes, young lady, how may I be of assistance? Do you know anything about Ouija boards? I know all there is to know about them. Youngsters like you tend to poke fun at such objects. The girl's friends, accordingly, snickered at the back of the store. Yet, those who play with it rarely repeat the experience. And there are those, of course, who aren't lucky enough to be able to repeat the experience. The girl mulled this over. Why do you sell it at the store, then? I smiled. If I told her the truth, she would think me a joker and not go through with the ritual. So I lied. These are items that directly connect to places better left alone. If one were to destroy said item, one would find themselves in the darkest tangles of destiny. By their very nature, these objects must exist to keep the balance of the world. Oh, how they ate that up, and with such earnest expressions. The girl who was talking to me was especially entranced. It can be healthy to experience these things, such as Ouija boards. If nothing else, they can humble those who jeer at things much more powerful than they are. I eyed the girl's friends. So you're saying you'd rather curse other people than be cursed yourself for the greater good? The girl asked. I nodded. You catch on quick. The girl handed me the Ouija box and I passed it over the scanner. What are you planning to do with this? Contact someone dear? The girl shrugged. Some boy at our school was killed in an abandoned warehouse north of the town. We want to see if his spirit's there. Spooky stuff. The girl laughed. Very spooky stuff. Hey, pal, the boyfriend of hers said in an overly aggressive tone. Yes, pal, I repeated. Boys like this were always the first to crumble at the sight of a threat. Their wills were weak, their minds feeble, susceptible to the tiniest divergence from their authority. Most humans were, but some more than others. That board ain't cursed, now is it? Spun the board in my hand, I undid the small strip of tape and opened the box, showing it to them. This, my youngster, is but cardboard and wood and a little bit of glass. This ain't cursed, but you are doing the cursing. If I had to give you one piece of advice, I'd tell you to leave this board and everything that has something to do with it alone. Oh yeah? What then? You gonna sell us some herbs to cast away devils? And the boy laughed. I pointed at the patches of herbs at the back of the store. I could. Would you like some? I do advise you take them. Just buy the Ouija board, Mary, the boy said, half laughing as he walked out of the store. I decided then that that one would likely be the first to go. The girl, Mary, smiled at me politely. Sorry for them. Sorry for them as well, I said with a shrug. Mary paid, and I handed her the box, wishing her the rest of a good day. Just as she reached for the door, I called back. Miss? Yeah? Here, I've got something you might want to take. Oh, I'm out of money. That's all right. It's a special offer. I like to treat my polite customers well. And I smiled. I've got to be careful with my smiles. I've turned people away through... It's supposed wrongness. Mary felt none of it, however, and returned to my desk. The girl was so honest, so naive, I had to hold myself from sprawling laughter. I pretended to search the shelves behind me, 
held out my hand and materialized the necklace. An amulet. My blessed gift. I showed it to the girl. The amulet was a simple cord with a small metal raven attached to it. It looked masonic and rural. Perfect concoction. This, I said, is called the Blessed Raven. This is an ancient amulet worn by Celtic priests when they battled the forces of evil. The amulet by itself is made of simple materials, but I had a bunch of them blessed in Tibet. They should protect you, should anything bad happen. Anything bad, she said. I shrugged. Spirits are, by their nature, temperamental. The realm beyond is tricky, so it's good to be prepared. She held out her hands. Do you accept the amulet? Sure. I closed my hands around it. Do you accept it? Yes, Jesus, I accept it. I felt the bond form and smiled again. This time, the girl recoiled, even if suspiciously. Thank you. She exited the store in a rush. Falling back on my seat, I let out a sigh of relief and chuckled. <laughs> Once again, they had fallen for the blessed gift, like raindrops in a storm. I've achieved a lot over the years. I was proud of my kills, proud of my hunts. For today, or very near today, I would celebrate with a feast. They'd never see the demon before it was at their throats. Demons do not as a rule appear out of nowhere, nor is their existence something lawless that ignores the rules of the natural world. Our existence is very much premeditated, necessary even. Even if we are few, and our work is not substantial enough to change the tide of history, rumors of us tend to keep humanity in line. We do not eat humans, well, some of us do, but not because we need it for nourishment. We hunt, and it's the killing that sustains us. Our bodies turn the act into energy, sweet, sweet energy and merriment. Our means of hunting and preparing the prey also vary. Each of us has very constricting contracts, which won't let us do as we please. For us to be hunters, we need to be strong and fast and, above all, intelligent. These are traits not easily given. They must be earned, negotiated. They must be exchanged. I, a Gehrman, operate in a very quaint manner. I am bestowed with a capable body, though I cannot hunt my every prey. For each group I go after, one member must survive. Hence the amulet, the blessed gift. A gift for the human who survives, and a cursed nuisance for me. I must offer the amulet to a human, and the human must accept it and wear it. This chosen one will be completely and utterly physically immune to me, from the moment they put on the amulet to the moment death comes knocking. This may cause hiccups during a hunt. If I hunt in a populated area, the amulet human might escape and get help, and I will be powerless to stop them. Imprisoning them is considered an attack, and as such, I can't stop them from leaving. My own survival, my hunts, must take place where no help can be reached. Most importantly, the amulet human is to be my weakness. A single touch from them would burn my skin. A punch would break my bones. A single wound could become fatal. I'm a monster to humanity, but these few humans are monsters to me. Nonetheless, they pose me no danger. I'm careful in selecting them. They must be the weak link of the group, the naive soul, who will either be too afraid to face me or too sick to get to me. I felt them, felt the blessed gift, getting away. I could sense its direction, its speed, the heartbeat of the one who wore it. I knew when she took the amulet off to inspect it, then put it back on. I know what she thought as she thought it, and I know she felt uncomfortable all the same, as if something was watching her. It was. I 
was. Even after this hunt was over, even after she threw the amulet away, there would be a burn mark shaped like a raven on her chest. I would never be able to touch or hurt her, and I wouldn't need to. I would disappear, only returning when it was time to plan my next hunt, years from now. I wish I could still feel those who were saved by the blessed gift. Did they hate me? Did they fear me? Somehow, had they ended up revering me as a force of nature. There was one I'd like to meet again. I'll never forget those eyes. She'd been a little girl, and if still alive, she'd be but a withered old crone now. Her health had been lamentable then, so I doubt she lived this long. So I sat, and while waiting for Mary and her friends to take the Ouija board to the abandoned warehouse, I thought back to my glorious hunts and my disgraceful hunts, to that horrible, wretched hunt. That day my body had been masked as a friendly bohemian of a lean but frail build. I decided that the campers on the remotest side of the mountain would be more willing to pick a hitchhiker up if he looked as non-threatening as possible. Thus, I made my body into a thin bohemian. I could always bulk it up. Later, maybe. The first traveler that picked me up was a pleasant couple with a child. As a rule, I never went after couples. First, because hunting a single person was unsatisfying. And second, because the amuleted member of the couple would be greatly inclined to hunt me down in vengeance. Though that wasn't a worry I normally had with so many campers going around, I was sure to find another group. I caught two more rides until I found the perfect people. I ended up coming across a batch of young adults and teenagers having a picnic below the viewpoint, and two of the youngest were in wheelchairs. The girl in the wheelchair had a visible handicap on her left leg, while the boy was pale and sickly. It looked like their older brothers had brought them along with their friends, though they hadn't done so out of obligation. They all looked happy and cordial, but there was a hint of discord in the undertone of some of the strings of conversation. I smiled. It was so delightful. Sorry to disturb you, but do any of you have any water? I could see that the older one eyed me warily. Was I vagrant? Was I dangerous? I held up an empty bottle. I ran out a couple of miles ago, and the last time I drank from a river, I ended up having the shits for a week. That got a laugh from them, and the older ones eased up a little bit. I have a bottle right here, the girl in the wheelchair said, grabbing one from her backpack and handing it to me. Well, thank you, miss. What's your name? Marilyn, she said. And just like that, I was in. In for the hunt. Through comical small talk, I was able to make the group accept me for the night. I had canned food in my backpack, which I shared. I had cannabis and rolling papers, which made everyone's eyes light up. Hadn't I been who I was, these youngsters would have remembered this night for the rest of their lives. Only Marilyn and the boy in the wheelchair eyed me warily. Are you well? I asked. She looked away. Hmm. I had to earn a place in her good graces. She was weak and her health seemed frail. She'd be a good fit to wear the blessed gift. You don't seem okay. My lungs, they're... Not great. Asthma. I nodded as if I perfectly understood the ailment, and as if it had brought me, or a dear one, suffering as well. You know, when I was... Hey, Marilyn, one of the teenagers said. He was tall and buff and looked much like Marilyn. Leave the guy alone. Marilyn's eyes turned back to her feet. That's all right. She, she's cool, I said. The boy looked at me as if... I was some alien who had no conception of human culture. Cool, you say? He wore a jeering grin. Yeah, sure thing. 
After engaging in an uninteresting conversation with Marilyn, who appeared to be greatly immersed in what she was saying, I got up to go to the bathroom because the time seemed appropriate, sociologically speaking. I don't really use the bathroom. I use the opportunity to spy on the group from afar to observe their interactions. As soon as I was out of earshot, of human earshot that is, the group turned on Marilyn and the sickly boy. God, Marilyn, you're so lame. You never talk to us and you're talking to that bum, the oldest boy said. You never let me speak, she protested. The girl next to the boy, who I suppose was his girlfriend, slapped his arm and said, Don't be nasty to your sister. She's the antisocial freak, not me. Tears strung Marilyn's eyes. Screw you, John. The scene went on for a while, a time I used to plan the next part of the hunt. I returned and sat near Marilyn again. She was still sensitive from before, though I managed to bring her out of her shell by asking her about her friends, what she usually did in her spare time, her favorite books, and so on and so on. She liked the classics with monsters, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein or Bram Stoker's Dracula. I was alive when those novels were published, so in a way, they were very dear to me as well. I occasionally had to switch the conversation to the other kids in the group, but I tried to talk to Marilyn as much as I could. And an interesting thing began to happen, something that had never before come to take place. I kept the conversation going out of pure interest. I was sick, most probably. Demons can have illnesses of the mind, or so I've been told, yet the effects was clear. I was enjoying the conversation, and as such, I kept it going. I could have introduced the amulet a long time ago. Hours ago, in fact. The sun was setting, and the group decided to hop back in their truck and ride to a campsite 20 minutes away. They were kind enough to let me ride with them. I do sense something strange today, I eventually said. Me and Marilyn were in the back of the truck together with the sick boy, who was quiet and refusing to attempt any conversation whatsoever. Something strange? How so? Do you know why I wander around so much? It's because I hate cities. The reason's simple, if you can believe it. I can feel bad things. I can feel bad feelings. In a city, there is stress, anxiety, sadness. There's violence, frustration, and pollution. Out here, there's just nature. There's peace. There's an order, an ancient order, harmonious in so many aspects. Here, I feel safe. Marilyn nodded towards the front of the truck. You're probably feeling my brother, then. I felt him a long time ago. I'm feeling something different now. I reached over to my backpack and froze. Should I? The moment the amulet was around her neck, it'd be too late to halt the hunt. These thoughts of mine befuddled me. They, they weren't supposed to happen. Why me? Why now? Are you okay? She asked. I nodded. The sullen boy glanced at me quizzically. Yes, I'm sorry. As I was saying, I feel something different now. Something I've felt before in these mountain ranges. I think something evil lurks in these woods. This could help. I bit my lip as the amulet formed in my hand. I clutched it in my fist. Marilyn lit up. Ooh, what is it? Some kind of artifact? Some witchcraft thingy? I smiled, and it wasn't a grotesque smile. It was painful. Yeah could call it that. This is an amulet, the Blessed Raven. It's a gift. Oh, thank you so much. It's for me, right? Of course. Do you accept it? It's pretty. Damn right I accept it. I nodded, hesitating, then handed it to her. Something in my chest weighed down as she put the amulet on and I gained insight into her mind, into her heart. She was happy, content even, that someone was talking to her, making an effort to get along with her. Does it look good on me? she asked. 
suits you just fine, I said. It was strange how I knew that even if I had to, I wouldn't be able to kill her. Nevertheless, the hunt was on now. It was too late to turn back. The kids set up camp. I helped. I also helped Marilyn down from the truck. Slowly, my thoughts turning to mush midway as I thought them. The sickly boy kept studying me as if he had already guessed what I was. Even if he cried wolf, what good would it do? Destiny was already set in stone. You keep spacing out, Marilyn told me. I'm just tired, and the woods are really beautiful around here. Marilyn nodded but also dark, a little too dark if you ask me. Marilyn's brother lit up a fire. I had to surround it with stones as embers kept threatening to light the grass on fire. The forest would have no option but to witness evil today. Let it at least not see fire. The group naturally came to rest around the fireplace, stabbing marshmallows and crackers with sticks and holding them up to the fire. It was a chilly but pleasant night. Have you ever heard of the Midsummer Ghost? A boy said. And so it started. I glanced at Marilyn. She'd be safe. She'd at least be safe. The Midsummer Ghost always hides like a man in need. You never see him for who he is, for he only lets you know what he is the moment he's got his claws in you. This was too fitting. God was playing tricks on me. Legends say that he was a little boy who was abandoned in the woods by his parents. They hated him, all because he was deformed and broken. It's said the boy never died, and that he was taken in by the woods and became part of them. He asks for help, as help has never been given to him in life. If it's denied ever again, the midsummer ghost will slice and pull your entrails out and dress himself in them. The children were silent as I began to let go of this human form. What was I doing? Why wasn't there a way to stop this? But there was, and it would cost me my life. The sullen boy in the wheelchair moaned, grabbed and shook the wheels, then raised a finger at me. One by one, Everyone at the fire looked at his hand, then turned their head at where he was pointing, turned to face me. I wasn't smiling. I was no longer myself. Marilyn was the last to look at me. Her eyes watered as my skin came apart to reveal my hard, thick fur swaying as if I were underwater. Her brother screamed. The others followed. All except Marilyn. Above fear and horror, above disgust, Marilyn felt disappointment. I wanted to end the hunt there and then, but I couldn't. If I stopped now, it would be my life on the line. Why? Marilyn asked. I lunged. I attacked her brother first, went for his throat, saw his blood made dark by the light of the fire seeping into the leaves and grass my body finally finished cracking out of its fake human cocoon free at last there were few sensations as pleasant as the soft earthly wind caressing the claws at the end of my tentacles caressing the thousands of small tendrils emerging from my mouth my true form felt the freest and yet I wanted nothing so more than to return to my human shape. Marilyn was white as snow, the expression on her face that of a ghost who'd long left its human body. She was seeing a monster, a gigantic shrimp of black fur and eldritch biology, a sight reserved for books, for nightmares. Marilyn turned her chair and sped down into the darkness of the trees. The entire group scattered, in fact, yelling for help, leaving me alone by the fire. I looked at it, empty, aghast at what I'd always been. I stomped the fire until it was nothing, just burning coals left behind. 
I ran after the two girls who were always next to Marilyn's brother. Their, their bodies were pumping with adrenaline, running faster than they would have otherwise considered normal. I caught up to them while barely wasting a breath. Thus worked the wonders of my body. I crumpled the head of one against the trunk of a tree, then robbed the heart out of another. With each death, my body became lighter and healthier. The hunt was feeding me, making me whole again, and I was emptier than ever. One by one, the group was lost to me. One by one, they were rended by my claws. I tried to kill them before they got the chance to fully look at me. I didn't want to be the last thing they saw. Lastly, I came before the sullen boy. He moaned, afraid. He'd sensed me from the start and knew he was doomed. Those closest to death often have that skill, though it's a skill that rarely saves them. I'm sorry, I said. Stop! A trembling voice came from behind me. It was Marilyn. I glanced back and saw a petrified girl clutching a kitchen knife. She hadn't run away. She'd gone to the truck to find a weapon. Foolish girl. I can't. I'm sorry, Marilyn, but I do what must be done. I'm bound by the rules as ancient as dawn. You showed me things. I thank you for that, but I cannot stop. I raised a claw. Please stop, she sobbed and pushed the chair on wheels with all her might. I brought my claws clean through the boy's skull. His soul vanished instantly. I felt crippling despair emanating from Marilyn, pain so hellacious my lungs failed to pull in air. I couldn't move, not while she wore the blessed gift, and her mind streamed all its intensity into mine. The knife in her hand plunged into my back. There was pain. An entire universe threatened to pour out of me. The agony of the countless people I'd thrown to death's precipice threatened to overwhelm my existence. Above my physical ailments was only Marilyn's pain. It took centuries worth of stored energy just to keep myself from passing out. She removed the knife it clattered to the ground. Remorse, all her anger and fear, turned into simple, mundane remorse. I'm sorry, little one, I whispered. Marilyn, sobbing, yanked the amulet off her neck and threw it over where the knife had been. Where the amulet had been, her skin smoked and the shape of a raven formed. She'd always be safe from me. That was my only comfort. It was curled up, trying not to move. Each breath of mine was raking pain. I was told even a punch from one who wore the amulet could prove fatal. Here I was, stabbed, black, slick blood like oil gushing out. Won't you finish me? I croaked. I'll find you, she managed to say through shaky breath. I heard her wheels turn, cracking dry leaves as she escaped. The only human to ever touch me disappeared into the moonless night, into the embrace of the forest. My head was filled with visions of Marilyn as I walked to the warehouse. There was something odd happening with Mary, the girl who'd brought the Ouija board. I felt the usual fear and anxiety, yet there was something strange in her emotions, as if they were thin, as if they were veiled. I scouted the perimeter around the warehouse, spied through the windows. I saw the four teenagers moving the eyepiece over the letters on the board, laughing with their nerves on edge. The little fools. I smiled. I went to the front door, let go of my human skin and waited until my true body came to light. The sun was nearly set, the sky bathed in those purple tones of dusk. 
It was the perfect hour for my hunt. I opened the door, entered, and closed it hard enough to make sure my prey would hear me. I set a chain around the door handle, and I froze. The girl, sporting the blessed gift, ceased being scared at once. Instead, triumph of all things filled her heart. Oh no, I had walked into a trap. So you've come, Agaramon, a familiar voice said to me. I was still and aghast. I wanted to be content to hear Marilyn again after all these years. I wanted to go and hug her and ask her how she'd been. But that wasn't how our relationship would go tonight, was it? She was old now. Old and worn and tired. You've learned my name. I haven't heard it spoken aloud in a long time. Everyone I spoke to judged you a legend, but I knew you were a legend that bled. Bleeding legends can be killed. I spared you out of necessity. I should have killed you when I had the chance. I was afraid, but I know better now. I spent my life trying to correct that one mistake. She smiled, gesturing at me. And my chance to do so just arrived. She walked into the few remaining shreds of light coming from the hole in the roof. Marilyn was old and weathered, though she wasn't in the wheelchair anymore. She walked with the help of crutches, but she walked. She had a weapon held towards me. It was a kitchen knife. Everyone, you can come out. Mary walked over to Marilyn. Other people, sauntering in from the shadows, all holding weapons. Blades, knives, bats, axes, everything. All showed the burning raven mark below their necks. I recognized each and every single one of them. They were people I had permitted to live while forcing them to be aware of their loved one's deaths. I smiled, finding glee I hadn't known I had. Last, I was the one being hunted. The girl who bought the board was a good actress, I said. My grandchild, Marilyn explained. I trained Mary well. You were hard to find, and I was sure you'd be harder to catch. Hopping from town to town, always changing appearances. You really were a ghost. A rather interesting ghost, an old man said from the side. I remembered him. He was a historian whose colleague I had hunted during an expedition. I found you in documents centuries old. You once struck up a friendship with a monk who studied you. I nodded. That man had been a lot like Marilyn. He gave you a name after your philosophy. Agaramon. How many innocents have you killed since then? Hundreds? Thousands? Too many, was my answer. Do what you must. I did what I had to do, so I won't apologize. You know I cannot attack you, but... That doesn't mean I can't wear you down. Or run. I turned to rush the door, but there was a young woman there with the raven mark below her neck. She had a pitchfork. It's no use, Marilyn said. We each had our weapons blessed. I spent decades studying you. You might be fast, you might be strong, but against us, you're powerless. I won't sit idly by as you hunt me. And Marilyn smiled, so very much like me. The sweet girl I'd known was nowhere to be seen. I had transformed her into a monster. She had never wanted to become that. Blessed weapons couldn't save them. I could dodge bullets, so evading their attacks would be a piece of cake. I would walk out of there victorious to live another day. 
Marilyn seemed to guess what I was thinking. She fished something out of a purse and handed it to her granddaughter. I squinted and froze. It was one of my hairs, a short knife, and a vial of thick black oil. My blood. Don't look so scared now, Agaramon. You must know what this is. Surely you know what will happen if you try to hurt a wearer of the Blessed Raven. I squinted, jumping up on a wall and trying to climb out a window. Bullets flew and ricocheted all around me, and I was forced to retreat down. Damn it! Marilyn put the hair on the knife and emptied the vial over it. She handed it to Mary, who got on her knees, put her hands on the ground, and raised the knife above it. Triumph. So strong. Triumph emanated from that girl. You killed so many. I know this was your nature, but it was a corrupted nature, Marilyn said. If it had been anyone else, I wouldn't have cared. But this was Marilyn. I was unable to doubt the rightness of her words. There are others like me, others more dangerous. You should have lived your life, been happy, counted that as a blessing, should have counted that as a gift. You threw your life away. She shook her head. I will hunt others after you, or those who will come after me will, at least. I'm old. I need to rest. Marilyn held her hand out, telling her granddaughter to wait. When you hunted me, something happened to you. As if you didn't want to be doing what you did. It took me years to accept that. You were paralyzed by me, and as such, you let me strike you. You bled. I tried to run again, and again, bullets came. This time from the outside. Marilyn truly had found all my victims. I was starting to panic. My fur swayed furiously. I was outmatched. I was told humans would become too fragile after a hunt to come after me. Demons could be so blind. All you stand for ends here, Agaramon. Thanks for saving us. Yet that will never account for your sins. No, wait! Marilyn nodded, and her granddaughter stabbed her own hand with the knife, blessed with my fur and blood. A knife with me in it. A pain washed through me all at once. This was a direct breach of my contract. A part of me was hurting aware of the amulet, and as such, I paid the price. I screamed, fell, convulsed. I saw colors bursting as pain threatened to subdue me. Then I felt a kick, a punch, a hit, one after another, all from the branded, all from those I had saved. The dark unconscious I'd brought on so many finally caught up to me. I smiled as my prey became the hunter, and life eluded my body, becoming but a husk of ancient oaths. You're still here. Thanks so much for joining us for tonight's spooky tale. If you'd like a little bit more spooky in your life, why not click on one of the videos that appears at the end of our story? Or maybe head on over to one of our playlists where you can get your fill of spooky content. If you like your spooky a little more tactile, I've got a new book that's come out. If you'd like your own copy, there's a link below in the description where you can get your own copy of my spooky book. If you like what you see here on the channel and think you might like to support in a more monetized way, then why not come over to Patreon or become a member on YouTube? Speaking of, let's go ahead and thank our members now. Thanks to Siv Garstead, Unicorn Hollow, and Heather for being our spooky ghost contributors. Thanks to Janet, Lee Kendall, Psycat, Rhonda J., Sue Casper, and Valinator for being our spooky skeleton tier contributors. And thanks to Hi Stacy, Winter, Zeronin, Stephanie Carrington, Tyler Parker, Cinnamon Fox, and Sarah Samar42 
for being our ghostly reader tier contributors. Thanks, everyone. We just couldn't do the show without you. If you too would like to support the show, we always tell you to come on down to Patreon or check out my member section on YouTube. Spooky Skeleton contributors get their video 12 hours earlier at 8.30 a.m. as opposed to 8.30 p.m. And ghostly readers get a book every time I write one on their doorstep. There's actually one coming up here in a few weeks, so if you'd like to get in on that, please go ahead and sign up. And as always, thanks for stopping by. Dr. Plague, signing off. Have a wonderful evening.